this documentary, I mean, just first and foremost, the documentary on Gwen Shamblin was absolutely yeah. insane. I mean, so many people would be like, this is bonkers. But so what drew you to this role? HBO that two-parter documentary blew my mind and I was just hooked. I was hooked on the story and then I was hooked on her. And I only looked at it because I'd gotten the offer and I didn't know who she was. But once I went down that rabbit hole of Gwen Shamblin's crazy journey, I was like, well, you can't write stuff this good. When truth is better than fiction, and it's such a juicy character that is so complex and so much going on, and it also spans 20 years, and you really see, you see the decline of her mental health as her, the ascent of her hair. They seem to kind of like the hair gets bigger as she just gets less and less in touch with reality. It's a story that you can basically track through the hair. I want you to tell me about the physical transformation into Gwen. Okay. A beautiful thing that you know her in and out. You have, it's, it's obvious, it's apparent that you have consumed yourself, empathized with her, understood where she was coming from. But I want you to take me to that makeup chair. How long did you spin in hair and makeup and transform into this awesome character? Well, I would say because the wig, the wigs were so good, and the woman in Mar in Montreal, who was the the head stylist, the one who ran, you know, that department, she was great with wigs, and she cut the wig and styled the wig, and then had the two wigs, the Bob, the church young church lady Bob, and then the the mountain of hair, those two, she had about three looks within each that she could add extensions and style it. She was so great. And I probably spent, I think they allowed two hours for hair and makeup. She had to put the wig on, you know, get my hair all flat because I had, I had a lot of hair. So then she had to make it all like, so there was no hair, put the, the cap, then the wig and then secure it. And because it's a great wig, it was super feather light. So it wasn't like a cheap, heavy wig because it was real hair put in one hair at a time that kind of a wig. It was very hard on my head, like it, when it would come off, my head would ache a bit. It was just, it was just a lot. Lashes and lip liner that just, I just would track where she was in her trajectory and how outside the lines she was willing to draw and how dark around the eyes and how she became almost cartoonish. And what was really fun was to recognize where she was and how much she'd lost the plot and how far she'd gone so that she had the dysmorphia that a lot of um, people with anorexia have, which is they see a bigger body than what is in the mirror, but their eyes are broken. Mm -hmm. So in a way, I thought of her as having dysmorphia around the hair and the eyes and the lips so that she had, she was seeing something different that, than what we see when we look at her. That in the idea also in anorexia, and like the psychology of it is sometimes about to become young and small, like a little girl. And she got shrunken and shrunken and her eyes got bigger and her lips got bigger and her hair got bigger. And it just, she started looking more and more like a kind of a crazy baby doll. It was, I think it made her feel beautiful. It must, she must not have felt beautiful that she needed all of this minimizing and maximizing and just so much changing of her natural self, that her natural self, she must have felt so bad about that she needed to be more and less. And I think about in our culture, how much that's normalized. And we're all so busy trying to make ourselves more or less unlike someone else or like what the culture dictates is the, you know, the what is beauty and where is the tenderness and the kindness and the, the gentleness about self-acceptance of age, of differences of beauty in how we were made and I don't know it just breaks my heart it just feels so so mean